Uh, questions from last week, last lecture, about anything else? Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, about the project, uh, uh, the, the research papers we search the should contain a method of the security validation, or we do the security validation. Okay, so the question is, do the papers, are the papers about methods, or are you doing methods on something else? And the answer is either. So it's your choice. So you can do a research project where you look at a method, and then you're going to cite the papers that introduce that method or apply it to different things. Or you could do a research topic where you pick something to study, like a security target, and then you might, you might do the, the methodology yourself. So you might say, oh, I want to do an evaluation framework of this, and then there's no paper that does that. But you're using the papers because in the evaluation framework itself, you have to figure out, am I giving a full dot or a half dot? And then you're using the papers to, to make that judgment call. Cool, cool. Other questions? Okay, so where we left off last class is uh, we talked about stride, and now we're talking about evaluation frameworks. So you'll recall an evaluation framework is a way to compare different alternatives. So we're going to try it out on the idea of uh, alternatives to passwords. So there's lots of alternatives to passwords. Uh, we have a list of them, like single sign-on, uh, two-factor authentication, password manager, et cetera, et cetera, biometrics, that kind of stuff. Okay. Then uh, what we want to do is we also want to have some criteria for comparing them. And so I said it's useful. It's not strictly necessary. Uh, but it's useful to split your criteria up into security and then things that would impact the ultimate like use or not use of the technology that aren't security. So something like cost could have a large impact, right? The number of servers or computers that you have to change. You know, if you have to give everyone a new hardware token and you have to register it, right? Those are things that, that even though they're better on security, they're worse on some other dimension. So we call that dimension deployability. How easy is it to roll the system out? That's deployability. And then we also think about the human user, right? So if we have this super secure system, but it requires you to memorize a 100 character password, right? Yeah, that, that is more secure. No doubt about it, right? But it's not usable. No one's going to ever use it, right? Um, so here are some, some properties. Uh, so we, we started a list yesterday. I, I, I filled in a couple more. But on usability, these are the kinds of things you might consider. So nothing to memorize, right? So uh, am I, if I have 100 websites, am I memorizing 100 passwords, one for each website? Do I just have one master password? Or is it even like it's just my fingerprint so I don't even have to memorize one password, OK? Um, cognitive burden is sort of like how hard is it to use the authentication system? Um, users with disabilities, uh, can they use it? So you have a motor disability. Uh, you can't type. Uh, are you able to use a system? You have a visual disability. Uh, are you able to use a system? Uh, is it understandable? Uh, how efficient is it to use? Like, how many seconds does it take? How much effort does it take? That type of thing. Um, error rate should be low, right? So if you're copying like some code that you got sent to you over text message, you do have to copy it character for character from your phone into the computer. And if you make one mistake, Right, then you have to log in again, or maybe you have to generate a new code or something like that. Okay, so we want low errors. Um, if you if you lose whatever your authentication credential is, how easy is it to recover? On security, um, how well do I know you? Does that help me guess your your way of authenticating? Right, with passwords it does. If I know you better, I might be able to guess your password better. Um, what about someone looking at what you're doing? So it could be a person looking at what you're doing. They're on your shoulder looking at you type in. Uh, it could be malware that's sitting on the machine. It could be some sort of keystroke logger uh, that's logging every key that's pressed. Um, so we call that internal observation is, is like within the computer. So malware, keystroke logger, and then external observation would be like someone physically watching you, security camera or something like that. Uh, how easy is it to guess? Uh, is there a trusted third party involved? That could be more of a privacy thing, right? Like is Facebook knowing every time you log in, that might not be a desirable security property from a privacy perspective. Um, what about theft? Is there something I can steal and now I'm you? Uh, what about phishing attacks? Uh, so if I 
trick you into going to a website. It looks like your bank website, but it's not. Uh, if you authenticate to that website, is it game over? Is your credential gone? Or is there something that, that maybe you could do to prevent that? Um, I'm just gonna look ahead and see if I talk about phishing, I can't remember. So like phishing, for example, I, I don't, we're, we're not gonna use that one, so I'll just say a second thing now. Do any of these things prevent phishing? So if I go to a fake website and it asks me for my password, I put my password into the fake website, the website now has my, has my password, right? What about two-factor? So the website's going to go to my real bank and say, it's going to put, well, as soon as I put my username and password into the fake website, it's going to just relay that to the, to the real thing. The real website's going to generate a two-factor authentication to my phone, right? And now the fake website's going to say, okay, what's your code? And then I type it into that, and then it just relays it back to the bank, okay? So it even generates it at the right time. Like there's, there's nothing off about that experience, right? Um, and so that doesn't pre prevent it. Right? Biometrics, well, first off, I mean, we don't really have it, but if we had it for websites, I'd point my fingerprint, that has to still get sent to the website because they have to check whether it's me or not. Right? So it will just get sent to the fake website, the fake website will pass it on to the real website and then it's either me or not. Right? So is there any of these that actually do anything about phishing? So uh, let me show you the list again, because uh, it's from last class. So that idea of having a fake website that sort of proxies, like I tell it something and it goes to the real website, we call that a man in the middle, okay? Could be a woman in the middle or whatever, but anyways, it's <laughs> always been man in the middle. Um, and so the, uh, that type of attack we're gonna see again and again, okay? That's like an attack that, that we wanna prevent. But would any of these prevent that type of attack? Okay, and why? But it could still do the same thing, right? So it could still, uh, the fake website could say, log in with your username, password, and then it feeds it to the real site. And then the real site is like, okay, give me your RSA token. Then the fake website says, give me your RSA token. You give it to the fake website and then it relays it. Okay, 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 so good point. So first off, this might differ on the exact token itself. Okay, so there are different, RSA actually has a whole bunch of different things. The thing I'm thinking of is the classical, like it just, it's a number on a key fob and you type it in. So it's really no different than two-factor other than you're getting it from a device screen as opposed to from your phone screen type of thing. But yeah, there are ones that uh, you can like plug into your computer and things like that. Now what is it going to check that's going to prevent the phishing attack? So you're on the right track. So the one thing that's different about a phishing website is the URL is different by definition, right? Now there, there are other ways like you could take over the website like DNS hijacking or something like that. Th those aren't phishing, that's like beyond phishing, right? But with phishing, the URL is always different, okay? So any technology that only coughs up the credential to the right URL is going to prevent the phishing attack. So for example, the easiest one would be the password manager. So the password manager, you'd be on the banking website, be like, well, I don't know my password, I just saved it. But your password manager isn't going to be prompting you because it doesn't recognize the website, right? Now you could maybe manually go into the password manager, find your bank, you're like, why isn't this working? And copy and paste it. Like, it not, it's not necessarily going to save you at the very end of the day, but at least it's going to give you that, it's not going to just drop that password in, okay? And maybe that's enough of a prompt to you to think, well, why, I know I saved my password, it usually works. It's not being filled in. Maybe there's something different about this website. So that, that's, for example, something that would prevent phishing. Or at least like have some, res, some level of resistance uh, to phishing. Um, okay, deployability, how, how expensive is it? Uh, how complicated is it to implement? Uh, maintenance, uh, backwards compatible, is it going to break how everything works? Uh, how mature is it? So. Is it something that someone thought up six months ago, right? That hasn't really been tested. That's maybe an authentication scheme that we wanna see. We wanna see people use it for a bit before we go and adopt it widely. Um, whereas like passwords, they've been around for 30, 50 years. 
uh, you know, they, they, for all their flaws, they do seem to work. Uh, complexity as well, like, like uh, if the server has to do a lot of processing in order to authenticate you, maybe you're doing some fancy crypto thing and it has to like grind out like uh, on a password or something like that. Um, we'll, we'll see an example of that. But anyways, that's, that's a consideration as well. Okay, so this is meant just to be a, a rough sketch. So not all of these are like perfect for an evaluation framework, but it's just to get you thinking about the differences between a usability, security, and a deployability criteria. Okay, now the next thing we'll do is we're gonna turn these into proper columns, okay? So we're gonna say what it is. Um, normally in a paper, you would give a definition of it. I'm not gonna write a definition out, but you would say at least one or two sentences about exactly what does this mean. And then you're also gonna say, I'm willing to give a half dot, full dot for this criteria, what does it mean to get a full dot? What does it mean, especially the half dot? The half dot can mean a million different things, right? So you need a really precise, crisp definition of, of what all of those mean, okay? So I'm not going to do it for all of them. I'm just going to pick a subset just to show you a few of them. So uh, we'll start with one. We'll call it physically effortless. Okay. So this is going to be a usability criteria. I'll say U1 for usability. Um, and it basically means like, like how much effort is it to use the system, right? So like typing takes some physical effort. Pulling a phone out of your pocket takes some <coughs> physical effort. Putting your finger on a fingerprint reader, maybe less physical effort. Um, you know having a file, a cryptographic file that has a key, just automatically send it, then there's no physical effortness, right? Other than like navigating to the website itself, okay? So what we can do is we can think of a scale. And so we could say we could have a part, uh, uh, no dot, half dot, full dot. And so full dot is best. Okay, so that means we basically, we never have to type or draw in the case of a graphical password, swipe, that kind of thing. We, we never have to do it, okay? Uh, the worst case would be, there's different ways of defining this, okay? So like, there's, there's no right or wrong way, I'm just giving you an example. Um, but if you think of like 100 different sites, the problem with the passwords is if you follow password advice specifically, you should have memorized 100 passwords for 100 sites, okay? So we could apply that same reasoning here. Um, if I have to log in uh, 100 times, am I typing or drawing 100 times? Okay, so that, that would be the worst. So if I type and draw on every single login, then that's obviously not physically effortless. If I never have to, then it's physically effortless. Okay, now this is kind of, once again, this is phrased positively because you want the full dot. Okay, the best authentication scheme will have the full dot. Now we could think of a middle ground. So you might say, well, what about like a password manager that has a master password? Then you have to type it in once, but then once you type it in, then you don't have to type it in again, right? Or I do Facebook Connect, so I have to log into Facebook once, but now that I'm logged into Facebook, I can just click, 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 click into the 100 sites, okay? So that might be like a half dot. Right, it's, it's, it's neither this or this, right? You're not typing it every login. You're not never typing it, right? You're typing it once per, for every 100 websites or something like that, okay? So we, we could say, okay, I, I want a half dot for that. Now you don't have to use half dots, but, um, but this is where it's sort of logical to, to use one. Okay, uh, nothing to memorize is the other one. So this is more about like the effort of, of typing it in, and then this is more like the brain storage. So once again, we phrase it so that you want it to be nothing to memorize, okay? So that's the most positive, okay? So nothing to memorize, the full dot would be literally what it says. There's, there's zero things to memorize, okay? Uh, a master password could be in the middle where you have to memorize that one password, but once you have that one master password, then it's going to remember all your other hundred or thousand websites. So we could say 
zero passwords is a full dot, one password is a half dot, and then like a hundred, I'll just, I'll phrase it as two plus, but basically like one, one per site. Actually, that's maybe a better way. Um, we'll say one overall and then one per site would be like no dot. Uh, nothing to carry is another usability one. Oh, sorry, say it louder. Yeah. For uh, nothing to memorize, it would be zero. Zero, yeah, yeah. So biometric would be zero. Okay, uh, nothing to carry. And we'll do that exercise in a minute, like going through and, and assigning the dots, but yeah. Okay, so full dot will be exactly what it says. I'm not carrying, I don't have to carry around anything special. Uh, empty dot would be like, I have a new thing to carry around. So the most example, the most common would be like an RSA token. I give you this RSA token, you have to have it. You forget it at home, you're not logging in. It's that simple, okay? Um, so something new. Now I'm also noting that in the assignment you'll, you'll have to do this. Uh, so I want like a full sentence. So like this is very sketchy because it's just classroom notes, right? Uh, but, but you should very precisely say what it is. But anyways, now you might argue, well, what about two-factor authentication with your phone? Is that something to carry or something not, right? Well, you do have to have your phone with you. It's like the RSA token, right? But at, on the other hand, you are carrying your phone around with you everywhere, okay? Usually, or it's, it's something that you often would be carrying anyways. So it seems like kind of not as bad as an RSA token. Like you're more likely to have your phone than to have this like special purpose RSA token. Also, the, the, the other thing about it is another dimension you could look at is like, if I have 100 accounts, do I need 100 RSA tokens? Like usually that's not the case because only like governments or like your work or something would have an RSA token. But imagine if every website in the world is like, this RSA token thing is the best. We're going to send you a token and now you have 100 of them and then you have to find the right one, right? At least with your phone, it would be like sort of organized as well. But anyway, so so we could say I like a half dot for like you 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 do have to carry something, but it's something you're probably carrying anyway. Okay, so it's not a new thing to carry; um, it's something common. Now, everyone in this room might do the dot slightly different. Okay, but everyone in the room would probably more or less arrive at the same kind of criteria. Like the idea of how many things you have to memorize, that's going to be like pretty common, right? Like it's, it's hard to not evaluate passwords without that notion. Now exactly what that middle dot is, it might vary a bit as well. And that's okay, okay? So there's, this isn't like a hard science where like everyone's going to replicate the exact same chart. But the point is that uh, across the room, there's going to be a large consensus on what the properties are and, and sort of what the evaluation criteria is. Okay, so yeah. Okay, uh, we'll consider some security properties as well. Okay, so I'm gonna load two into this idea. I'll, I'll explain why in a second. Okay, so I'm gonna have a property, I'm gonna call it resilient to guessing. I'm going to distinguish guessing from impersonation, okay? So impersonation is still a way of guessing, but it's like guessing using knowledge of you. Okay, so um, I might guess your, like I would say the word, like I would guess your password, but I'm trying like the name of your dog or your cat, kids or your parents or whatever, the hometown you were born in, that type of thing, right? So there's that kind of guessing. I'm going to call that impersonation because I'm, I'm using knowledge about you. What I mean here by guessing is like pure brute force, 
just exhaustive search. Like, I don't know anything special about your password. I'm just going to start with A, and then I'm going to try B, and then I'm going to try C, and then I'm going to try AA, and then BB, and then AAA, CCC, you know, and eventually, eventually I will get the right one, right? So how resilient is your password to that kind of guessing, okay? Um, Okay, so what makes a password hard to guess? Say loud, loudly. Okay, length, randomness, special characters. Okay, so those are the three things. Why does length help? Okay, okay, so the number of possibilities increases the longer it is, okay? Uh, and it increases exponentially. Okay, so that's something that rolls off the tongue, but like that, that really means something. Like if you double, 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 like the numbers get big fast, really fast, okay? And so if you add another character, it's like, it's, it's not just like doubling the hardness of guessing, it's like multiplying it by itself, by itself, by itself, okay? Um, so that, that's good. Okay, uh, special characters, it's sort of the same thing, okay? So it's kind of like the numbers, uh, the, the number of options for each character. Okay, and if you want to get really specific about it, the number of possible combinations will be how many characters you have. So let's say it's 26, and the length of your password is 10. Well, it's going to be 26 to the power of 10. Okay, so that's how you calculate it. Okay, um, so so that's fine. Now, um, okay, let's say you have a five-digit PIN. Can I brute force that? So it's not long enough. We don't know? What about a 20 digit pin? Okay, where where where's the cutoff? How many how many digits do I need? Just for a ten like a, a ten digit like sorry, each pin number is it's between zero and nine, right? So it's ten for each, right? So like how many digits is enough? So four four is not four or five's not enough. Twenty maybe is enough. Does anyone know like what what's what's sort of the cutoff? Okay, so I, I don't expect you to know it, I was just curious. Um, but anyways, this is sort of, if we think of a number line in terms of the number of combinations, so this is like zero combinations and this is like a lot of combinations. This is sort of how it breaks down. So if you have two to the power of 64, okay, so a, a, a pin number is 10 characters 10 is roughly two to the three, two to the three is eight, close enough to 10. And so you can take this number and kind of divide it by three, right? And then you'll get a sense of, of sort of like what it would be in like terms of a pin. Um, this can be like easily brute forced, okay? So this is like in the brute force. Like on a laptop, like completely insecure. Okay, uh, if you get up to two to the one twelve, actually, so that's a number from this. This is like what we call like cryptographically secure. Okay, so this is like not going to be brute forced by all the supercomputers in the world running for the lifetime of the universe. They still won't guess this password, probably with overwhelming probability. Okay, and and sixty four versus one hundred twelve. That's not a big difference, right? You've, you've less than doubled the length of the password, but that's the exponential growth, right? It goes from something I can do on my laptop, I make it twice as big, and now you can't do it in the lifetime of the universe, right? That's, that's sort of exponential growth, okay? And what we have in between is sort of like, it's, it's like theoretic, like nobody would want to protect their information with, no one would want to guarantee that you couldn't guess this. In practicality, you, you know, it would cost you millions of dollars to crack something in this, and you might not be able to crack it. Like if it's two to the 111, you're probably not going to crack it, okay? Uh, Bitcoin is like a cryptocurrency. It does about two to the 70-ish hashes, uh, which is an operation in about 10 minutes, okay? So that's sort of in this region, but that's like, that uses like, I don't know, I've heard it uses like 1% of like the global power or something like that, hydro. Like, so it's like an enormous operation that's devoted to this one task, okay? So this is like technically in reach, but like nation state 
like not not like you know not an average hacker kind of thing. Okay. So it's sort of in in between. Okay, now let's go back to the, the, the three things that make your password good. Okay, so one is length, and the other is the number of characters. So both of those just increase this number, right? The number of characters increases the base, the length increases the exponent. It's much better to increase the exponent, right? I'd rather have a really long pin than to have like a short alphanumeric password with lots of special characters. You can work out the math for like when they cross over or whatever, but, but generally you want the, the big number to be in the exponent. That's, that's a much better place for it. Okay, now the third thing that someone said was randomness. Okay, so just because I have something that's 20 characters long, is that necessarily a good password? It could be like the lyrics of my favorite song, right? That, that could easily be 20 characters. It might have some numbers in it, it might have you know, explanation marks, it might have like capital letters and short letters, okay? But it still might be guessable, right? Because humans, you know, when we choose things, we don't choose things truly randomly, okay? So all of this, this whole chart assumes what we call uniform randomness, meaning every two to the 64 combination is equally as likely as everything else. Okay, now the next thing is, um, let's take something like your banking pin. Okay, so we all have pin cards, and how many digits is your pin? Mine's four digits, some, some banks use six digits, right? Uh, could you brute force that? You can, right? 10 to the four, that's, that's definitely down in this region. It, wouldn't, it would take like milliseconds on a computer, right? Okay, but, but why do banks do that then? Why do they give you a four digit pin if they know, like you, a four digit pin, you could actually manually, you know, brute force. Like it wouldn't take that long to type in 000, 001. Like it might take an hour, but you could actually do it by hand, right? And so why, why would a bank use something that's that insecure? Okay, okay. So there's limitations on how many guesses you get, right? So after like three guesses, it might lock you out. Now, a lot of websites will do this too. So if you just show up to Facebook and you start guessing someone's password, what happens? First, they, there's two things. One is they might just lock you out. That's fine. They can't lock you out. Well, they might lock the account of the person you're trying to log into, okay? So that's, that's the first thing. Now, if you have 100 accounts, or you need more, you need like 10,000 accounts, and you don't care which one you log into, you just wanna log into one of them, right? Then as soon as they lock out the first account, then you could switch to the second account and try some passwords on that and keep going, okay? So lockouts don't necessarily help. Um, the other thing that websites can do is they can uh, slow down your bandwidth, right? So they'll, they'll wait and think about your password and they'll keep doubling the length uh, until like every guess kind of thing. So it takes longer and longer. Or like iPhones and things are like that. Like if you put the pin in wrong, then it's like, wait a minute and then you put it in wrong again, it's like wait 10 minutes, and then it's like wait an hour kind of thing, okay? So you have this kind of exponential back off, okay? So there's ways to stop guessing attacks that work at the systems level, okay? So you're using a computer system to rate limit how fast somebody can, can guess passwords. And then there's occasions where someone has like, say a, a representation of your password called a hash. They don't know your password, but if they guess the right password, it's gonna match that hash value and they'll know they got the right one. And in that case, they can go as fast as they want. As fast as, as their computers, they can use multiple computers, whatever, okay? So when we think about resilient to guessing, we tend to think about, are you trying to guess through a computer system or are you guessing like, like you're touching the password and you can go as fast as you want, okay? So when you guess through a computer system, we call that online guessing because you're going, you're going through this online system, okay? And the idea is that in an online system, you don't need as big of a password. You can get away with a four digit pin because you can just block the person after three attempts, okay? But in an offline system where there's, no, there's nothing stopping you, there's no speed bump, you can guess as fast as your computer, then you're gonna need a longer password, okay? So some passwords are, or alternatives are resilient to online guessing, uh, but they're not resilient to offline guessing. And then other ones will be resilient to both online and offline.
kind of thing, okay? So that's why we're gonna break it into two uh, properties. So S1, and then I'll, later I'll, we'll map all of them into this like kind of spectrum and, and see. Um, but we can think of like resilient to online guessing. And then S2 is the same, but just for offline. Okay, and so this means that you're guessing through a computer system. That someone else controls, right? That, that you don't control. And they can rate limit you and things like that. So rate limit means the, the speed at which you can guess is limited. Uh, you can lock out. Now lockouts have another consequence, which is you can also use it as a denial of service, right? So if I want to lock you of your account, I just guess three times wrong on your password, and now you can't do anything yourself. You can't even log in as well. So um, yeah. OK, so then we can come up with a scale. In this case, I'll just keep it simple. So basically, I'll say that the, the randomness in the password is less than 2 to the 64, and here it's more than 2 to the 64. And then for offline, we'll have the same thing, but I'll use 212 as the cutoff. So this is the randomness. in the, I'll call it a credential because it could be a fingerprint or something. It's not necessarily a password, but basically the secret. Okay, what does that mean, two to the 64 randomness? That means it's equivalent to flipping a coin 64 times, okay? So like if you write down heads, tails, you think of all the combination of coins, you flip 64 coins, all the combinations, it's equivalent to that. So it's the same as choosing a, a random, uniformly random uh, combination from it. Uh, there's a name for this, we call it entropy, uh, or Shannon's entropy in this specific case. And so you'll learn about entropy probably if you take 6110 or if you've already taken it. Um, it's relevant to like keys and cryptographic keys and things like that, okay? Uh, but it's basically, if I say something has 64 bits of randomness, it's the same as saying there's two to the 64 options, combinations, and they're all chosen uniformly random. Those are two equivalent statements, okay? And they're also equivalent to saying it's the same amount of randomness as flipping a coin 64 times, okay? So anyways, I don't worry about the numbers. Like for this, it's more qualitative that we're thinking, but uh, that, that's what the numbers mean if you're curious. Okay, S3, we can do uh, resilient to physical observation. So if I'm typing or drawing something, then somebody can watch me do it and then they can rep they can steal my credential. And if I don't have to type or draw, basically I don't have to do anything physically, then there's nothing to steal, right? So my computer, it just automatically logs in because it has the right key stored on it on the hard drive or something like that. Uh, resilient to physical theft. So if I can steal something and then log in as you, then it is not resilient to physical theft. Um, if there's nothing to steal, or if what I can steal is not sufficient, let me put it that way, stealing is insufficient, 
So, like, I might steal your RSA token. Does that mean I can log in? No, because I still need your password, right? So it's, it's not sufficient in that case. So it's still secure even if I can steal. Um, so stealing is uh, insufficient for logging in. So that's what you want. You want it to be insufficient. Okay, and then uh, deployability, I just picked a couple. Uh, so we'll think about cost. For a full dot, we want the full dot, so we want it to be low cost. I'll phrase it as negligible cost. So if there's no new cost, that's the best. The worst would be like, it cost me something, and the worst would actually be it cost me per user. So like I have to give an RSA token, they're 10 bucks each. And if I have a thousand students, I have to spend a thousand dollars, or sorry, $10,000. And if I double the number of students, I have to double how much I pay, okay? So this would be, uh, there's, a, there's a cost per user. So we sometimes call it a, a marginal cost, but I'll just, I'll write a cost per user. And in the middle, there might be scenarios like single sign-on where I got to put a server up. So it's a brand new server, I gotta pay it, I gotta pay the bandwidth for it and all that stuff. But once it's up and it's running, whether one user is using it or a thousand users or 10,000 are using it, it doesn't really cost any different, right? It's sort of, it's a one-time cost and it doesn't really matter how many servers, how many users use it. Maybe the bandwidth changes a bit, but it's, it's negligible. Um, so we'll call that like a one-time cost. Yeah, go for it. So what is the cost of like 10,000 Yeah, like you mean like what the dollar value or? Yeah, like you cost, like you cost me now shipping and buying the server and the server can hold even 10,000 users. So if the users increase by 10,000 users, the work value will increase by 10,000. Okay, okay. So the, the question basically is that this isn't necessarily an empty dot and half dot. Like this half dot means it's better than this but this could actually end up costing you more than this, right? Like if it's one buck per head and I have a thousand users, but I have to go buy a server and the server's $2,000, right? Then even though it's a one-time cost, it costs more to do the server than, than all of the users or whatever. That's the question more or less? Yeah, so, so in that case, so that's correct. I, I accept that reasoning. So this isn't perfect is the answer. You could try and you could also just add up the amount of money, right? So you could say, this is zero dollars, right? Like I say, everyone in the room might do it differently. So I might say the total cost is zero dollars. The total cost for this is like between, you know, um, let's say less than, less than a thousand dollars, more than zero, but less than a thousand. And then this would be like over a thousand dollars or whatever. So that, that might be another way of doing it. So like, yeah, so you, you can, different people will disagree on how exactly to rank it, right? But it's clear that if you have something that's costing $10,000, it's going to get a bad score versus something that's free, like regardless of how you do it, yeah. Yeah. Before carrying out the evaluation, I have to remove all the solutions that I'm gonna photo from the right. You wanna remove all the which? The solutions that? Okay, I see, I see. So this evaluation is theoretical. So you're gonna look at the system and, and like we're gonna rank a bunch of things that maybe you've never used. I've never used an RSA token, but I'm gonna evaluate it anyway. So the evaluation is done at such a level that you don't have to actually buy it to try it in order to evaluate it is, is basically the idea, yeah. So you'll include things even if they are too expensive, you'll include them just so it's complete, but your evaluation is like very high level. Now that might not be true in some cases. Some cases you might have to actually get your hands on it. Then, then it's true you you couldn't evaluate it essentially. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that we try and do is we don't evaluate the brand. Like we're not going to evaluate Facebook Connect itself. 
we're, going, we're trying to evaluate the higher level idea. The idea of you're going to go ask someone else whether this is the person that you think it is. They're going to have, handle the password for you and just you know sign them in or not. Like, so that's like kind of the principle. So the principles don't change so much, right? So like evaluation frameworks, like you wouldn't do like Windows versus OS, Mac OS, because then you're comparing two brands of things, right? You might say, well, what about a capabilities-based OS versus you know, a non-capabilities versus OS? Because that's more like an underlying principle. And then you might not evaluate like the whole operating system because there's a million components to the operating system. You might look at like how are permissions handled between these two. Not, not these two brands, but these two different like philosophies of how to do an operating system kind of thing. So yeah, so we, we're always like trying to compare the kind of the philosophy as opposed to the brand or at least it goes better. So if you kind of distill it down, and then um, uh, yeah, and then you you try and keep your comparison like scoped to, to something narrow. Okay. Other questions or comments? Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, okay. So there's there's two things there. So one thing is if I, instead of like, let's say I want to play some mobile game that I just downloaded, and they decide, hey, instead of putting up a server that I'm going to manage for my game, um, and I'm a game designer, I don't really know anything about security, I'm going to pay a cloud service like Azure to, to do it, right? So, so there's that component, and yes, that could lead to more safety. So you could work a security criteria. So we don't have a criteria that covers it, but you could work it in. Um, the second thing you could do is you could consider just in general, um, like server side, is it like, let's say someone breaches the server, what do they get, right? So if I breach the server, am I getting everyone's password because they're just stored in raw plain text? So that would be bad, right? Yeah, if I have them, they're hashed, they're hashed a million times with salt or whatever, um, then that's going to be better. And then if it's a biometric or two-factor, like how does that change that? Or like it might be worse, like think about the RSA token, right? If I get that seed, that master seed that's generating all these random numbers, could I like compromise every RSA token in the world with one server breach? Okay, the answer to that is yes. And I'll tell you how that happened way later when we talk about social engineering, right? So, so the way that you do passwords might make it better, it might make it worse as well. Yeah. So you could absolutely come up with a security. And then you also have the privacy consideration. So if I'm, every time I log in, it's running on, on Amazon's cloud, does Amazon know how many users I have and all that data and stuff like that, right? So then you might penalize them, you might get the, like you might make them better on security but worse on privacy, a trade-off. Exactly, exactly. So ideally you would have those two criteria and then, yeah, one might get a full dot on one and, and no dot and then it would switch. Okay, other questions, comments? Okay, so let's just run through this real quick and then I'll show you uh, what it would look like if you were to write a paper and try and publish it. Uh, like a, so this is like the lowest quality version of an evaluation framework because we're just kind of doing it off the top of our heads. Then I'll show you the highest quality, and then I'm going to show you your assignment, and what I want for your assignment is middle, middle quality. So better than what we're doing now, but not as, it doesn't have to be as good as the paper I'll show you. Okay, so our rows are passwords, uh, biometrics, Uh, RSA token, uh, two-factor over SMS. I'll just put SMS, so that's like two-factor with a text message. Uh, password manager, uh, certificates or client-side keys, so like a private key that's stored on your computer. Single sign-on, Facebook Connect, that kind of thing. Uh, swipe patterns, uh, which we'll call graphical. 
Okay, instead of writing the full usability property, I'll just write u1, u2, u3. Uh, then we went to security. Okay, so we had something like this. Okay, so the first usability property is physically effortless. Okay, and the criteria basically is, am I, am I typing every time I log in, am I just typing once, or am I not typing at all? Okay, so passwords, am I typing, passwords just means like the traditional thing. Okay, so I have 100, I'm gonna log in the next 100 times, how many passwords am I typing in? Is it zero, one, or 100? 100, okay, so that's the worst. So it's going to be an empty dot. Okay, uh, biometrics. Okay, so we can have a debate about, like, is it a physical effort to put your finger on something? I would say, like, compared to, like, typing a password takes a bit of effort. I would say, like, biometrics isn't that effort. If it's, like, base ID, it's almost effortless. Okay, so let's say that, that this is the best, right? This is the main feature, it's really fast. You don't have to do things. What about RSA? Okay, even worse than passwords. Not only do you have 100, now you have to type in 100 random numbers. SMS is the same thing, you're just copying from your phone as opposed to a key fob. Password manager? Okay, so with or without a password manager, or sorry, a master password makes the difference between an, a full dot or a half dot. And so we'll say half dot because we said with a password, master password. So we type one in. Certificates. So this is a private key. It's stored on your computer. You, SS, you type SSH, whatever, login.ens.ca. You hit enter. How many passwords do you have to type in? Zero or one. So it could also have a master password, but generally it doesn't. So we'll say. Or you could get really like say, well, you have to log into your operating system. You know, that's a password, well, whatever. Uh, but anyways, let's just, let's say none. Okay, uh, single sign-on. So I'm using Facebook. So I have to sign into Facebook itself, right? But then once I'm signed in, then I can sign into 100 games without typing another password in. So that's another one kind of password. And graphical. Okay, so it's uh, empty, it's still 100 passwords. It, maybe it's easier to swipe than to type, but it's still uh, same thing, okay. Uh, now U2 is, uh, uh, how many things do I have to memorize? Okay, passwords, I have one for every website, so that's the worst. Biometrics, I don't have to memorize anything, so that's great. RSA, I still have my password. Okay, so it actually ends up being the same. Uh, SMS, uh, same thing, still have a password. Password manager, I have to memorize one password. Certificates, none. Single sign-on, I have my Facebook one and that's it. And graphical, I don't have to, or sorry, I have, a, I have 100 passwords for 100 websites. Okay, now does anyone notice anything between these two columns? Okay, they're exactly the same, okay? So this is something you might see, okay? Now if you see this, you have to ask yourself, are U1 and U2 actually the same thing? Are they just the same property? Is it another way of phrasing like, are you just phrasing the same idea twice, right? And then you can also think, well, is there anything that actually separates the two, right? So in this case, it's physical effort versus memorization. Now, when you have something memorized, you have to type it in. So usually a memorization results 
in some sort of type in. But you could come up with some examples, like maybe you have an, a brain, like people had this actually as an experiment. There were some video games where you could control it with your brain. So it had like a, uh, I forget what they call it, an fMRI. That's like the expensive version. EEG, I think, is the cheaper version. But like that's something where you could think about your password and then it could just log you in. So it would, you still have to memorize it, but it, you wouldn't have the physical effort. And then there might be something where you still have to do physical effort, but you don't have to memorize it. It's hard to think about what that would be. It'd be like if you have a certificate that's stored, but like you would have to like, I don't know. Yeah, that too, you gotta pull it out of your pocket and things like that. So, um, but anyways, it's already getting the worst score as well. Um, yeah, but it could be something like that. Actually, that's a good example. So a one-time password. So imagine in RSA, you still have your password and then it's just a second factor, right? But imagine you got SMS a one-time password, meaning there's, there's no password. You didn't memorize any password, right? The only thing that's authenticating you is your phone number. Then you still have to type the password in, but you didn't have to memorize anything. So in that case, it would uh, do well on U2, but not on U1, okay? So anyways, at the end of the day, I convinced myself that with these eight alternatives that we're measuring, they're exactly the same, but it, they, they are different properties, right? And if, uh, if I went from eight to 20 different alternatives, I might find a couple where the, they weren't exactly the same, okay? But anyways, you should go through that exercise. If two columns are coming out exactly the same, the other thing that might happen is they might come out exactly opposite, right? So like every time this gets a full dot, this gets an empty dot. Then you have to think about that too, and is there a relationship uh, between, between the two of them? So it's better to uh, the feature in the coverage independent. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they should be independent. You shouldn't have, you should not have like three properties that are phrased slightly different, but end up measuring the same thing. Yeah. Now the one thing this doesn't do is it doesn't give you a weight. It doesn't say this is more important than this one. That kind of thing, right? So generally you want more dots, but some dots might be more important than others. This won't help you with that. But anyways, okay, U3 was nothing to carry. Okay, so for of these things, what, what do I have to, which one do I have to carry something? So RSA I have to carry, so that one's bad. SMS, and in this case, I'm carrying something that I already have, right? Okay. And the rest of these, I don't have to carry. I'm carrying my fingers anyway. Um, now, actually, certificates. What about certificates? So in this case, I have that key. It's in a file. So I have to have that file with me, right? Now, it's generally going to be on the computer that I'm authenticating with anyways. So this one, you could go back and forth. You might say it's kind of like carrying your phone around because you have to carry around that file. But you might say, well, the phone, like I'm logging in on my computer, but I still need a phone, so I need two devices. Here I'm logging into my computer and the file's on the computer, so it's, it's nothing new to carry. So anyways, so this is where you might differ slightly on, so I'll, I'll give it the full dot. Um, but, but anyway, so like I say, it's like not everyone in the room does the exact same thing. You might get slightly different scores. But in general, the, the general trends should be, um, there should be large consensus on. Okay, S1 is guessing attacks, okay? Um, so this one was uh, online guess. And this is offline. Okay, are any of these things secure against offline guessing? So offline guessing is I can go as fast as I possibly can. Okay, so certificates will be. Okay, they have a true proper cryptographic key. Okay, so they're, they're secure. Okay, no one's gonna guess that key even in the lifetime of the universe, okay? Things like one-time passwords that you get from either the RSA or the SMS, your password's not gonna be enough, okay? Your, your password's not cryptographically secure, okay? But the second factor is something that's being chosen completely at random, and it tends to be pretty long, right? Um, and so it, it actually depends. So it depends on the usability and how long they make it. 
but uh, there is the potential that these two could kind of, you could get 112 bits of randomness with that one-time password. I, you'd have to do the math to figure out how many digits it needs to be. But usually with Microsoft, I'm typing in, I think six or eight digits. Um, so that's like 10 to the eight. So that's, that's not, it's not at this level, I guess. But, but anyways, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say like, Let's say it's like three quarters, kind of, okay? <laughs> Just for fun, why not? Okay, but it's close, but not, not quite there. Okay, uh, how, how about passwords themselves? Like a human chosen password. How secure, are they, we know they're, they're not cryptographically secure, uh, but are they really that bad? Okay, but we're, what, what do people actually go out and choose? Do people go out and choose meaningless, random things? Okay, if, if you actually wanted to choose a new password for your email, like Concordia is like, okay, you need to choose, you need to change your password. We got breached, you have to change it, right? Are you actually gonna like choose a random password? Okay, so it's gonna be something you can memorize, which means that there's gonna be a pattern there, right? A pattern that's discernible. Okay. Now people sometimes underestimate how much of a pattern there is. Like they're like, well, I'll replace every letter E with the number three, right? Cause it kind of looks like an E, right? But like people build these dictionaries for guessing passwords and they know all of those tricks, right? How do they know it? Well, they know it because passwords leak, right? So they leak and then they look and they say, okay, what are the tricks that people do? Right. And you see all these like, English looking words, but every E is a three, then they're like, oh, I'll just write a rule. And then now it can like take every English word in the dictionary and then just replace them all. And it can try it both ways, right? And it can capitalize or not capitalize and things like that, okay? So the truth about human passwords is, is that they're, they're actually really terrible in terms of guessing. And so uh, this is an occasion to show what might be my favorite picture in all of computer science. So this is what human passwords look like graphically. Now this picture is not going to mean much to you until I explain it, but I'm, I'm going to explain it and you're going to come in to, to know and love this picture. I guarantee it. I just need to make it a bit bigger. Okay, so everyone can see that. Um, okay, so what, what are we looking at? So the story behind this picture is a very, very long time ago. I, f I forget, I think it was in the 90s. Uh, there was a website called Rock U. It was kind of like Facebook. It was like a social media. It had a music focus to it. And uh, their, password, uh, their passwords got leaked. Okay, so there were millions of passwords. I forget the exact number uh, that were leaked from this website. Okay, and uh, so researchers were like, okay, now we can study how people actually choose passwords. Okay, um, the other thing about the website is it had a very relaxed, it basically had no password policy. So if you want your password to be one, then that can be your password. Or if you want it to be A, then it can be, okay? And so people took advantage of it and a lot of people just had like a four digit pin. Okay, because that's sort of what people are used to. They're used to it for their bank or whatever and the website would accept that as a password. Most websites won't do that today, uh, but back then it would do it, okay? And so what the researchers did is they said, okay, let's just look at all the passwords that are four digit pins because I can show it to you. Like it's hard, every letter combination, it's too many, there's too many combinations to show you what the patterns are. So let's like bite off something that's manageable. I can, I can show you every four digit pin because there's not that many of them. There's only 10,000 of them. 
okay? And so this picture of this big blue square is 10,000 passwords, okay? It's all the 10,000 pins uh, that you could choose from 0000 to 9999, okay? They're all represented by one of those little blue squares in the diagram. So you can see the full space of passwords, okay? Um, now it's a heat map, meaning that uh, more than one person might choose the same password, okay? So if a lot of people choose the same password, uh, then it's going to be a darker blue. And if not a lot of people cho choose it, then it will be like a lighter kind of blue. And if it means anything to you, the scale is, uh, it's a logarithmic scale. So the darker it gets, it's kind of like an exponentially number, larger number of people are choosing it kind of thing. Um, but, but anyways, so you can set that detail aside, okay? So the way we read this chart is, let's pick a number like uh, one, two, three, four, okay? So what, what they did is uh, they put the first two digits on the x-axis and the second two digits on the y-axis. So if I want to find one, two, three, four, I would look for one, two. So one, two is going to be between 10 and 15, right? So it's going to be like right here kind of thing. And then I would go up to three, four. So here's three, five, three, four is right below it. So one, two, three, four would be right there. What do you notice about it? How, what's the color of that? Okay, it's pretty dark. What does that mean again? Remind me. Lots of people chose it. Okay, so that's like probably maybe the most common pin uh, that, that people chose. Okay, now there's some other stuff that we could look at. Um, what, well, what's some other common four, four digit things that you might choose? Okay, so we like things that have patterns, like zero, 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 one, 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 one. Where would I find those kinds of patterns in this diagram? Okay, so it's gonna be on a diagonal, right? So like zero, 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 zero will be here. You can see it's pretty dark. One, 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 one would be like here. Two, 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 two would be here. Things like one, two, one, two, that's still a repetition. They're gonna be along a diagonal. And lo and behold, can you, everyone see that there is a dark diagonal? Right. All right, so this is like X, Y, X, Y kind of thing, right? And the really dark ones are like, like five, five, four, 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 four kind of thing. So they tend to be dark. This one's just off. It's at actually 6969. Six, no idea why that's popular. But anyways. OK, so these are all the uh, things like that. What, what there are some other four digit uh, numbers that are popular? It's not, it's, it's reverse. Yeah, it's reverse. Yeah, yeah. exactly. OK, uh, what else? OK, so, so years. Right? So like a year, like 1999, 2003. Okay, so the 19XX would start here. So this would be like 19XX. And this right beside it would be like 20XX. So you can see, right? You know, this would be like 1980. Keep in mind that this website's like from 20 years ago or something. Like, actually, you can tell when it leaks. Yeah. How do you know when it leaks? Because like here, it like kind of dies off, right? So 2010. Yeah, exactly. 2010, 2012, like that kind of area, and that's basically when the thing leaks. Okay, um, so that's that's what these two things are. Okay, what about this? There's sort of like a weird shape here. It kind of looks like a castle, like the side of a castle. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, so uh, how many days does January have? It has 31 days. How many days does February have? Trick question, trick question. 28 or 29, depending if it's a leap year. How many, uh, March? April? All right, so you can see that pattern, right? So if aliens came to Earth and they didn't know anything about us except for the passwords that we choose, right? They could work out the calendar uh, that we use, okay? So this is like month, month, date, date. 
Now, if you're American, you might do month, month, date, date. In Canada, we like day, day, month, month. Well, look, there's like a flip of it right here, okay? The exact same pattern, uh, but this is day, day, month, month. Um, anyways, and, and then there's lots of other like little gems. Uh, so there's, let's see if I can pull off a couple. This one's 8710. You can pretty much pick a dark spot and then like kind of reverse out why. Um, I can't remember. I think this was the, there was an Usher album. Uh, I think it was 8710 or something like that. Uh, and uh, anyways, there was a dark dot there because it was a music website and uh, people were into it. Um, there was one that was, let's see if it's 8691. Oh, 5691. Five. Okay, I had it written in my notes, but I circled the wrong one last time. I, I have to like go over this. I, I do it every year and then I circle the wrong thing slightly and then it, it gets messed up. There was one that was like, I, it must not be 5691 because this doesn't correspond to it. But uh, back in the day before text messaging, before we had phones with keyboards on it, we had phones that just had digits on it. And if you wanted to send a text message, you could still do it, but you would have to do it through digits. So if you want to send the letter A, it would be like number one. And if you wanted B, you would press A or number one twice. And so anyways, if you spelt out love in SMS, like the keys that you have to press, like 5691 or whatever, that, that was one of the passwords that was popular. Um, so anyways, anyways, there's lots of patterns here. Like I say, you can look at, uh, you can look at, like there's sort of a dark streak here. So you can try and figure out, okay, why, why is there, a lot of numbers that have that end in or yeah that end in well yeah okay uh we talked about that one already uh you know but anyways this one's like four two three one i think and so okay i'll leave it in the notes you can you can take a deeper look uh but it it's kind of fun anyways okay so what's the moral of the story the moral of the story is if i'm guessing your pin i'm not going to go zero 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 one 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 two 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 Right, or sorry, I, I should say it different. I, I'm not going to go 0001, 0002, 003. I'm going to go 1981, right? 2002, you know, uh, maybe like 0000 because that's popular. One, two, three, four. I'm going to rank them in terms of popularity and then I'm going to guess them, okay? And because this is like a logarithmic scale, if I have 100 accounts and I want to compromise them, I can try one, two, three, four across all 100 accounts before I get locked out. And it's going to hit, it's going to hit on like five of those accounts or ten of those accounts, right? Or I can go through like maybe I get ten guesses before it locks out. I can uh, I can try the ten most popular, and I'm going to get some hits uh, on it. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the the moral of the story is that um, when it comes to to passwords and what dot we give it, it's it's really an empty dot. Okay. It's as empty as it can be. Uh, it's they're they're really terrible in terms of entropy. And then obviously it's going to be empty uh, against offline guessing as well. Biometrics are sort of in the middle. So biometrics give you some amount of entropy. There's a lot of dispute about it and it gets kind of complicated. But my understanding is that it's, you can't off, you're not going to online guess it, okay? Um, but in terms of a, an offline guess, you probably could try all the different fingerprints in the world and you could probably uh, like it might be beyond the capabilities of a laptop, but it's within the capabilities of a couple of supercomputers or something like that. So it's sort of like in this kind of territory. Uh, password manager, it depends. So if the master password is being chosen, you still have to get access to it. So that's the hardest part. But if I have the opportunity to guess it, then it's, it's going to be uh, bad. Yeah. So I'm putting in an empty dot, but it, this, like, whether this is empty half, quarter, 
three quarters. It's going to depend on the difference between an iris and a fingerprint. And they'll all have like the face ID and you'd have to get the numbers. So you have to go to the research community and say, how much entropy is in a fingerprint, right? Is it 40 bits or is it 60 bits or is it 80 bits? And then even then you might get different answers, right? So part of the problem is like how, uh, how sensitive the measurement is, right? So the more sensitive it is, the more consideration of every little detail is going into it. Therefore, the more entropy, okay? But if you're too sensitive, then I get a cut on my finger and I can't authenticate anymore, right? And so if I'm too sensitive or something else happens or, you know what I mean? Or like just the way I hold it, I have to like, if I'm slightly off it, it's like, yeah. So there's a trade-off between the error rate and how sensitive you can be, right? So that's why there isn't like just one number, this is how much entropy. There might be more there, but if you try and extract that much randomness, it's hypersensitive. Right, so you want to try, try, try and strike that balance where 90% of the time you put your fingerprint on and you are the right person, it's going to go through, right? Uh, but at the same time, if you're not sensitive enough, then you might have two twins or two people in the world that have enough of the same fingerprint that they can both authenticate, you know? Yeah, so, so anyways, these biometrics are tricky along these dimensions. So you can fight me on whether this is a half dot or empty. I'm just going to put it as empty, but yeah. It's like a kind of a research question. Okay, uh, single sign-on and graphical, they're still user chosen passwords, so they look the same. It's just, it's more like, are you choosing one password or 100 passwords? That's the difference, not the quality of the password that you choose. Okay, uh, S3 is uh, resilient to observation, okay? So shoulder surfing. Can I shoulder surf your password? Yeah. I can. Yeah. Okay, so nothing. Can I shoulder surf your fingerprint? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna put no. Once again, this is a matter of taste. It, it really comes to how you define the copy. I can't I can't obviously literally shoulder surf your fingerprint, right? But I could lift your fingerprint off a glass, print a 3D thumb that has the same fingerprint. And that's kind of the equivalent, right? So depending on how you define exactly, that's why these definitions are important. You may include or exclude that attack, right? Um, RSA, I can look over your shoulder. Uh, SMS, I can look over your shoulder. Uh, password manager, uh, if I see you type your master password in, then it's nothing. But if you get your master password in and now you're authenticating to the other 100 websites, then I don't see anything right because it's just automatically happening so I, I i forget if we had a half dot but that's kind of like i don't know if this exactly matches the half dot or if we gave it a half dot but but you could say that's a half dot this one is the the one example the the pure example where it's a file on your computer it's 100 percent digital okay and so like it just it goes there's nothing to observe uh single sign-ons like the password manager so if i see you logging into Facebook, then I can soldier surf your password. But if you're logging into the game after you've logged into Facebook, then there's something to see. Uh, and graphical, I can certainly see. Okay, and then S4 was uh, physical theft. Okay, uh, so passwords, there's nothing to steal. Biometrics. How, how dark do you want to be? Can I cut your finger off, right? We see it in the movies all the time. So I don't know, maybe we don't actually give it a dot. Um, RSA, I can steal your RSA token, right? But is that enough? No, because you still have a normal password, okay? So it still gets the full dot. Because it's as secure as a password. It just reduces. So the extra security that you get goes away and then it just goes back to this. But this already has a full dot, so it's going to have a full dot even in that case. Same with if I steal your phone. It's bad from a denial service perspective, right? But it's going to reduce the security back to, to a normal password, okay? Uh, password manager, same. Certificates, if I steal your computer, right? And that's sitting there in a file or I get malware or something on it then I can, I can impersonate you. So that's the drawback. No, certificates were doing awesome, right? They look like, like we should all be using certificates, yet this is probably the least likely 
that we use, right? So there's got to be something wrong with it. And so the big problem with certificates is I steal one thing and, and now I have your certificate, right? The other is if you don't have the right computer with the right certificate on it, then, uh, then you're out of luck, you can't log in. So those are the two kind of drawbacks. Uh, and then single sign-on and graphical, uh, there's, there's nothing to steal. Okay, and then quickly uh, in terms of deployability, uh, we had cost. Um, so RSA is the one that, that, you know, it costs per unit, right? Biometrics has a cost where you have to like, it depends, so Face ID, there, I mean, your phone already has a camera on it, so it's probably not an extra cost. Putting a fingerprint reader on your computer, like this computer has one, that, that costs more, right? Not every Mac has it, you know, it's like a higher tier of Mac that has it. Um, uh, and so it's not free. So, but it's, you, actually you could argue it's, it, it's not even a one-time cost, it's actually a per user cost. So let's say, let's put it as empty, I don't know. Um, and then what else here costs money? So your phone, you kind of already have anyways. So we'll, we'll say that that doesn't cost anything. Passwords don't cost anything. That's why people use them, they're cheap. So I'm gonna assume you already have a phone. But if you don't already have a phone and I have to buy you a phone, then that's probably the most expensive on the list. Okay, certificates, managers, graphical, these don't cost anything. They're just things that you input into a computer. A single sign-on, if I'm gonna offer that to my users, I do have to put up a server, or someone does. The, the, the party that I'm using, they have to put up a server, okay? So that's some extra infrastructure. Once the server is up, it probably doesn't matter if you double the number of users, the cost increase will be marginal. So this is like a good candidate for the half dot. Okay, so anyways, so that's a sketch, right? It's, we didn't spend, we didn't like dot every I and like write out every definition and everything, but it gives you a sort of a good enough idea of how these evaluation frameworks work, okay? So what we'll do still is I'll show you what it looks like academically. So I'll show you what a proper one looks like. And then we'll talk about assignment one because in assignment one, you're gonna do uh, one of these things yourself, okay? Uh, but we'll do that after a break. So uh, take 10 minutes and uh, come back at 27 after. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, 10 minutes. No, sorry, 17 after. Thank you. 17 after. So the second one's better. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the underlying technology itself rather than the brand name. But you also have to be careful about like, if you evaluate like a generation and a, the next generation, the next generation is usually always better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Sure, sure, sure. Hi. This is the first class, so I okay. didn't come for the last class. No problem. Uh, so I just need to know about the project. So did you tell anything about the project? Yeah, the yeah. Class? So I recorded last lecture, okay. and it's on the website. It's on the Moodle. It's on the Moodle. Okay. So you can watch it, and oh, I go yeah. through the project okay. in it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome.
Yeah. Hi. So, yeah, no um, another question uh, for the project. Uh, we're thinking about, for example, uh, the, the comparison between the doctors and visual machines. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm wondering if, because the, the, their types are a little different, their application, their usability, I mean, sometimes uh, from different domains. Right. Uh, is that that much of, uh, comparable to work on it? So first off, I would narrow it and think about, because you might use them for different reasons. Yeah. Right? And so think about, like pick, pick the reason that you want Security of VMs. Yeah, but security even, like, what does that mean? Like, mm -hmm. isolation of what's running exactly. inside from what's outside, for example. So, like, yeah. it contains. Yeah, that's kind of thinking about Right. Yeah. So what I would do is I start with the security problem. Like anything outside the container shouldn't be able to see what's inside, or it shouldn't be able to influence it. Like they're slightly different. They sound kind of similar, but you would pick yeah. one. Then you would say, okay, what are all the ways to prevent that security criteria? Right. So a Docker would be one, a virtual machine, sandbox, like whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then come come up with try and come up with all of the. It might be just like a cloud, use a cloud infrastructure or something or whatever. As long as it solves that problem, it's an alternative. Then once you have your alternatives, then yeah, you. And then you're not you're not doing like VMware versus like whatever like, like Citrix yeah yeah Citrix or whatever like it's sort of the underlying technology itself now there might be three ways of doing a VM and it has a different like it makes a difference for how you're going to secure it then you might evaluate the three of them like as as that like a VM that does this a VM that does that or three uh, three solutions for example Docker VM so you can have types and subtypes. So you can say, here's VMs, but there's three ways of doing a VM, yeah. and it makes a difference. Yeah. And so this, these are the three ways. And then here's a Docker, but it, there's only one way of doing it, so there's just one row. And about the parameters, can we narrow it to three, four parameters? Yeah, because narrower is better. A... You want to be complete. You mean like the, the columns? Yeah, exactly, yeah. because so you... we need to be a complete. Uh, right. There are many papers, and we should yeah, so you want to narrow the focus to like, I'm not going to compare everything there is to compare between these things, but I I really care about this one thing, like how well it contains my software, or how, you know, how well it keeps the outside, you know, uh, executions from, from accessing what's inside or like whatever it is, like write down what that security property is and then, yeah, try and keep your columns focused on, on that specific thing. For the project, my starting point is to, to get a solution for something or basically the evaluation. Both are acceptable. So if you get a solution for something, you need to evaluate it. So then that's where evaluation would kick in. That's why it's relevant for the course. So you can do both kinds of projects. So sometimes people, usually they do the, the second type, like a, more of a survey like kind of thing, but you can also do something like new, like you have a novel, here's a novel way of, of achieving some security goal, and then here's why I think it's actually secure. That's the evaluation. Yeah, I was asking because I didn't know if I had, if the project is, like, I have to address a problem, yeah. Uh, a living problem, something that's happening right now, and I have to, to try to evaluate something that, that we have a solution to that. Right. Yeah, so it's it's wide open. Okay. So like you literally can do anything as long as somewhere at some point you start talking about the evaluation of the security. It doesn't matter, it can be a new solution that you're proposing, it can be existing solutions, it could be one existing solution, it could be a comparison between ten or two. Like yeah, so so like uh, anyways, it's yeah, it's whatever you think you're best at. So it's a, it's a way of yeah. and it's always uh, based on papers. Can, can we like the servers like official? Website? So you start with the topic, and then you bring in what you need to do that topic. So in some cases, you should always at least check if there's papers, and if they are there, then include them. 
but it, it's certainly acceptable that it, like there might not be any papers about it. It might be like such a new topic that there's no papers about it. Then you're bringing in technical websites and blog posts and that. Yeah, if we could use, for example, their official website to add to your exactly. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it might not be covered academically because it's too narrow of a technical detail, or it, it's just too new. Those are usually the two reasons. But, yeah. I'm also thinking about the, uh, the, the comparison between the zero-trust infrastructures. Yeah. But I think it's so wide, yeah? Yeah, because yeah. each uh, company has its own uh, solution for uh, zero trust. Uh, yeah, it's become kind of like a brand branding thing. Mm -hmm. But like going into the technical details of what it is, I've seen some academic papers recently on zero trust, and some of the people that run the companies are from academia, so I don't know a lot about it myself. Uh, but it seems like there is a good idea there. But then there's a lot of companies that just use that term to try and sell stuff that they were doing already anyways and it doesn't there's no real like underlying technical shit. Okay, no problem. Yeah. All right, we'll get started again. If you go on the Moodle, uh, you can see a couple examples. So the assignment has a couple examples of these uh, evaluation frameworks, but the, the very first one uh, is, is this particular one. So it's on password alternatives. That's why I chose that as a topic so I could show you what it looks like uh, in real life. And so the first thing just from thumbing through it is you can see it's pretty long. So uh, they have properties. Every property is very clearly defined. Uh, then they go through all the different uh, kinds of things, uh, the, the different alternatives. They're all defined. And then the, the other thing that you'll see in the paper is uh, for every dot in the chart, there'll be a sentence somewhere that says, you know, for this system and this property, we gave it a full dot because this, right? Or, you know, and sometimes it's not like fully reasoned, like it's not like paragraphs and paragraphs, but there is at least one sentence somewhere uh, that says it, okay? So that's the key to an evaluation framework is every column is very clearly defined, every, row is clearly defined, what it means to get the dot is clearly defined for every column, and then why you gave the, the full dot, half dot, empty dot to the system also needs to be clearly defined, okay? So I shouldn't have any question about any of them. I might not agree with you, I might disagree with you, or I might have done it differently, but I can at least see why, what, what, what it means for you to have said that, okay? So I can at least, I can verify it. So anyway, so this is like 20 pages of really dense, and they're kind of boring to write because they're very repetitive, right? Um, but anyways, eventually we get to the chart. So you can see the amount of effort they put in is much greater than what we did. Um, so the, the columns here, uh, they also do usability, deployability, security. So we kind of talked about a lot of them, but I'll, I'll just quickly say in words, and maybe a, a few points about the ones that we didn't talk about. So they have mem memory-wise effortless, that's sort of like nothing to memorize. Um, scalable for users, nothing to carry, physically effortless, easy to learn, efficient to use, infrequent errors, that's one that, that we could have um, we could have covered better. Uh, recovery from loss is easy. On deployability, they have accessible, negligible cost per user, server compatible, browser compatible, so if you have to go changing servers and browsers, you're going to get penalized. Uh, mature, uh, non-proprietary, meaning it's not like a company solution, it's an open solution. Uh, security, uh, so physical observation, we talked about, that's so shoulder surfing. Targeted impersonation, that would be like, I'm guessing your password because I know a lot of details about you and what you might choose. Throttled and unthrottled guessing is, is what we called online and offline guessing, so that's another uh, term for it. So throttled would be you're guessing, but the website is slowing you down. And unthrottled would be you can guess as fast as you can. 
internal observations like malware or keystroke logger, that kind of thing. Uh, leaks from other verifiers is a new one that we didn't cover. Phishing, we, we talked about slightly. Theft, we looked at. Uh, trusted third party, so that would be like single sign-on Facebook. They're like learning every time you log into a website, so there's a privacy threat there that you'd like to eliminate. Um, explicit consent and unlinkable. Uh, unlinkable would be like between accounts. Um, so anyways, you can read more about the properties that we skipped in class, but you can see that they have more properties. And then the number of systems that they use is a lot more as well. So they also looked at password managers. Now, one piece of advice I've kind of doled out as people have talked to me about this, uh, but I'll, I'll say it again more explicitly is, when I do these, I don't like to compare brand names, right? So I like if Firefox and LastPass are both password managers and they both work exactly the same, I don't need a row for each of them. I just want, you know, one, Pass, the, the concept of a password manager, okay? Now, the, the reason that they decided to put brand names in isn't because they actually wanted to compare brands, it's because these two were different in terms of the categories. Specifically, this did not have a master password and this one did have a master password, okay? Now, I would replace it with like password manager with master password and without rather than Firefox and LastPass. So that's a personal preference, right? I like to distill it down to the idea. But the reason they have all these brand names isn't because they're comparing brands, it's because each of these is actually like categorically different. Like the way they work is, is different than the other ones, okay? All right, so password managers we talked about. Proxies is something else that I won't go into. Federated is like single sign-on. Um, so they have a couple different ways of doing it. Uh, so Facebook Connect is kind of what I had in mind of, of these ones, or OpenID. Uh, graphical, these, actually Pasco is kind of like a swipe pattern. It's like a, pre this paper came out before Android used the swipe pattern, I believe. Uh, cognitive is another kind of password scheme that, once again, I won't really explain it. It's kind of like CAPTCHA, so like Nick Hopper did CAPTCHAs and Hopper Bloom is, it's kind of that idea of like using like your sort of human cognitive capabilities to authenticate, but it's it's not through memorization. Um, there's a bunch of like pieces of paper that you can print out, you can carry around, and then you can like kind of read your password off a grid. Um, so that's that's another way of doing passwords. It gives you a lot of entropy, but then it's something you have to carry around. Visual crypto is another kind of like graphical passwords. Uh, hardware tokens, so RSA, secure ID is kind of what I have in mind. YubiKey is very popular. That's something that you would actually plug in. So it works kind of like a password manager where it's looking at URLs, but it's also storing passwords. And then there's some other systems. Uh, phone based, so like two factor authentication. Um, and uh, I lost it. Uh, so biometrics should be here somewhere as well. So biometrics. So they looked at fingerprint, iris, voice. Uh, and then they, they also looked at recovery. Uh, which you could think of as a, a separate question or not. Um, anyways, and then they, they have an example for each, so if you want to read some technical description of it, and then they have the actual evaluation, okay? So they use full dot, their half dot is like an empty dot, and then like the absence of a dot is like no dot. So it's slightly different visually, but it, it's, it's the same scale. And then what they did is the incumbent is just like passwords, and so if a solution did worse than passwords, then they made it red. And if it did better than passwords, then they made it green, okay? So when I read this chart, if I want to look quickly, I'm looking for lots of black dots all the way across, but also lots of green also is like a different kind of indicator that shows that it's improving on something in terms of, um, in terms of normal passwords, right? So for example, if I look kind of down here, I see lots of black dots, like hardware tokens, I see lots of black dots and green stuff, but only on this quadrant, okay? So at a glance, that's telling me they're really good on security, because these are our security properties, okay? But over here, I don't see so much green, I see a lot of red, and I don't see a lot of black dots. And so that's saying, well, on deployability and security, they're not as good. And that makes sense because you're carrying something else. You're copying codes from one place to another. You're paying for servers, new servers, new tokens, and things like that. So hardware is the type of thing that, it's the typical like, we're going to increase security at the cost 
of usability and deployability, right? Then single sign-on, you can see, actually it, it looks nice in terms of usability. It looks pretty good in terms of security. It's kind of bad on deployability, right? Because you have this whole new server that's in the loop. So that kind of like makes sense too. And then biometrics, you can see they're, they're good on usability, right? You, you have new infrastructure, so they're not so great on deployability. And security, they're, they're not so great either. They're, they're, they're kind of okay, but, but mainly not that good, right? And so that also kind of makes sense. Biometrics is like the usable thing that's not as secure, right? So anyway, these are the things that you can get just from a glance. So evaluation frameworks are good because they work at a glance. You can learn something. And then obviously, if you go dot by dot, then you can really learn something, OK? Then you can also pick out, like, say, a column and say, I really care about phishing. To me, like, that's the most important thing. So if you're not getting a full dot on phishing, I don't even want to know about you kind of thing, right? Or whatever it is that's your column. So you can, you can also do that uh, to try and drill down. And then the final thing that this showcase is, if I ask you, if I show you this, especially at a glance, I say, which is the best one? Which is the one that we should all use? There's no answer, right? There's nothing that has dots all the way across and green all the way across, okay? So when I look at this type of thing, I think, you know what? I bet this is a case where a bunch of people are doing this and a bunch of people are doing this and a bunch of people are doing this. Right? It's not like everybody's doing one thing. And that's exactly what we have, right? Some people do single sign-on. Some people make you do two-factor authentication. Some people just use a traditional password and username. You know, like some of us use password managers, some of us don't, right? And so it's like, it's all over the place, right? Why is it all over the place? Because there's no winner, right? There's no one that's clearly better than anything else, okay? So that's, anyway, that's what an evaluation framework is good at is like showcasing these, these kinds of properties. So let me write down a couple of these high level points. Then uh, I wanna talk, uh, I, there's one other thing I wanna explain about passwords, sort of how they work on the back end, and then we'll, we'll move on to a new topic. Okay, so evaluation frameworks. Oh, and, and your assignment, that's also what I want to talk about. Okay, so they're good because you can see patterns at a glance. So if you don't want to dig into all the detail, you can still learn a lot from them. They're good at illustrating trade-offs as opposed to like, here's the winning solution. The disadvantages of them is you have a bunch of dots and a bunch of columns. It really doesn't tell you like, is this secure, right? Like it doesn't necessarily answer those questions. Still like a very high level methodology. It doesn't mean that there isn't a flaw hidden somewhere in, in some of these things, just because it got a bunch of dots in the security columns, okay? So it's a high level methodology. And then uh, it also encourages you to look outside of security. So you uh, don't just consider security, you also look at deployability, you look at usability. And these are things that will ultimately impact whether people use it, which will impact whether it's secure or not. Um, so it, it indirectly impacts security, even if it's not directly about security itself. Okay, I don't know why this application wants to have a big black margin on the side, but anyways. Okay, let's uh, talk about your assignment. Um, so I didn't get too creative, I just took the same assignment from last term. Okay, so this is a topic that's maybe not as hot today as it was 
uh, in the past, but it, you don't have to go back too far uh, to find uh, people that were concerned about vaccine passports. So this was something new that, that came out. Um, so at a high level, what the assignment's about is, I want you to do an evaluation framework of something. I used to have it open-ended, like you could choose whatever you want. It's hard for the TAs to mark. Uh, the TA will mark it, not me, uh, by the way. Um, you'll upload it in EAS and you'll get your mark back through EAS. Um, so what I did is I said, okay, everyone's going to do the same thing. And so all of you are going to do a vaccine passport system. And I'm going to give you the rows. Okay, so you don't have to invent the rows themselves. All right. So what I did is you can go through the details yourself and then ask me questions next class. But um, I gave you three possible ways of doing a vaccine system. Okay, vaccine passport. So vaccine passport is like, I have the vaccine, you're showing at a restaurant and you're not allowed to go in the restaurant if you don't have it. That's the high level of it. Um, if you don't remember, if you weren't here in Quebec when, when you had to show it. Um, so there's the way that it worked more or less in Quebec, which is that you had this smartphone app, it had this QR code, the restaurant would have a reader, so they would read the QR code. And then you had some digital signatures and things like that, that, that sort of gave provision over, uh, over the QR code. Okay. So you can check the, the exact details as, as outlined. So you don't have to evaluate how the system actually worked. You just have to evaluate what's written here. Okay. All right. Um, then I said, well, that's one way of doing it. Right. But now you always have to have your phone and the restaurant has to have a reader and things like that. Like, are, is there not any other way of doing it? Like, so for example, just, uh, you know, in theory, what they could do is you have a driver's license, you have a health card, they could give you like a vaccine card. It has your picture on it, it has your name, it says you were vaccinated and you just show the card. No apps, nothing like that, okay? So maybe that's a better system, maybe it's not, I don't know, okay? But anyways, you can consider that system. And then uh, you could also have a system that's sort of like fully online. So in the Quebec system, the other thing I didn't mention is that you have this QR code, but if I'm at the restaurant and I'm looking at your QR code, I don't know if it's yours or your friends, right? It has your name, but I don't know your name, right? I've never met you before. So you actually have to show up with a driver's license. So they look at the pitch, they look at your face, they compare it to the picture on your driver's license. Then they look at the name on your driver's license and then they compare it to the, uh, the QR code, the, the name on the QR code, and then they, you know, then they look at the status on the QR code, okay? So you kind of have this like chain, you have to chain your driver's license to this QR and the QR to your status kind of thing. So you could have a system where like you just show up, they scan something, and then the app has your picture on it, right? Then you don't need the driver's license and a bunch of people don't have driver's license, right? You, you know, and so like it solves a bunch of other problems, right? But then maybe it's worse on privacy, right? Like, or maybe like the restaurant is like sitting there, like, you know, getting your home address, right? Because you came into the restaurant and now they're going to stalk you or something like that, or, or give you unwanted attention, right? You know, so you, you have to think through these things, okay? So anyway, so these are three possible systems. So there's the system that we use and there's two alternatives that seem sensible enough. Let's think about them, okay? Let's think about their security. Let's think about their uh, deployment, how expensive they are, uh, things like that. And let's think about their usability, both the usability from the person trying to go in the restaurant and the usability from the restaurateur who's reading these things, okay? All right, so the, in the first part, uh, basically what you'll do is uh, you'll do stride on each of the system, okay? And uh, what you'll do is you'll think of just one, well, actually, let me, I have to be careful here. I, I need to read exactly what it says. So, um, so what you'll do is you'll uh, start with the Quebec system. You'll do each of the six stride categories. And for each of the category, you're going to say, uh is like so let's take spoofing so spoofing is the first one okay is there a spoofing concern with this right so maybe spoofing has nothing to do with vaccination passports you can decide that and you can try and argue it or you might say no spoofing is like an important concern it's important that the person is who they say they are or whatever it is okay uh then you can say what is the system doing to stop like to prevent spoofing attacks right Oh, there's a driver's license and it has a picture or whatever, you know? And then you can say, um, uh, 
basically, is this successful? Is there enough countermeasures there that, there, that spoofing is no longer a concern? It was a concern, and then they did a countermeasure, and now it's no longer a concern. Or you might say, it was a concern, they have these countermeasures, but they're, you know, they're not sufficient, right? There's still spoofing attacks there. Or you might say, spoofing has nothing to do with vaccination. So those are the three kinds of answers, okay? And obviously, I, I have in my mind what I think is the right answer, but if you justify strongly enough an answer that's different, if your justification is good, then you'll, you'll get the marks, okay? So anyway, so you'll do that for stride, for, for spoofing, you'll do it for tampering, uh, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, escalation of privilege. And, uh, oh yeah, and the last system, you can just have one sentence where you say, is there anything different about these two systems? So this deals with spoofing, the Quebec system do, deals with spoofing in this way. If I switch to a physical card, is it the same thing or is it different? Right. And if I switch to online, is it the same or different? Okay. So you don't you you you'll go into more detail about this, and then you'll just have a quick remark about the the last two about whether they're the same or they're different. Okay. And so everything is like scoped to like kind of a sentence about each. So you should only have about five sentences in total per stride category. All of these limitations are just so that the TA doesn't have to spend hours and hours reading these things. Okay. Um, if you're half a sentence over, one sentence over, like no one's counting sentences, but we don't want like a page about each of them, right? Because it, it's just, it's too much to read, okay? Um, so, so anyway, so that's why these limitations are there. Okay, then what you're going to do is you're going to go and do an evaluation framework, okay? Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to come up with the columns that you would use to compare these three systems, okay? So you're going to do it for security, you're going to do it for usability, and you're going to do it for deployability. I want six columns for each. Six security, six usability, six deployability. Can you use the same columns that we use for passwords? Sure, if you think that that column is relevant in this system, then you can use it, okay? But most of them should be new because passwords and this vaccination passwords are not the same thing, okay? Um, so, so you can, if you feel the criteria applies, then that's fine. You can use it. There's no rule against it. But I'm expecting that a lot of your criteria will be new. Um, when you do the first part and you're thinking about stride, can you turn those into columns, right? Like, especially like security columns, right? Like if you're like, there's this spoofing attack, then can you have a column that's like, it prevents the spoofing attack? And the answer is yes. So the stride should help you come up with, um, with uh, security columns. Your security columns don't have to match stride one for one. So you don't have to have, it's resilient against this spoofing attack. It's resilient against this tampering, this information disclosure and all that type of thing. I'm gonna pause for one second. This is my son and daughter and other son. Class early? Does anyone want to end class early for birthday dinner? For us for birthday dinner? Yeah? Okay, okay. All right, let me finish the assignment because they care about it. I'll take five minutes. Five minutes and then we'll go. You can wait here if you want. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll just go through the assignment quickly, then you can get started on it. So six security criteria, six usability. Uh, and then in terms of the chart itself, you don't have to do the whole chart. You just have to do the Quebec row, okay? So I want the criteria to separate them. So like the reason you have that criteria is, is if you did all three systems, there would probably be some difference between the three systems, but you don't actually have to fill in every dot in it. Otherwise it just gets too long, okay? So you'll pick the Quebec system uh, and you'll, uh, you'll do the dots for, for all of your 18 criteria. Okay, and you'll have a sentence or two about why, why was it a full dot, a half dot, or a part dot. Fair enough? 
Okay, uh, questions about the assignment? Uh, yeah, no, like by dot, that includes a not a not dot, right? So like if you decide it's an empty, we call it an empty dot. So you can give things an empty dot. If you want like an NA or something more complicated, that's fine. Like you can write whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You just have to justify it. The TA has an open mind. He'll accept like things that are out of the box, but, but yeah. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Oh yeah, so the deadline, let me explain this quickly. So uh, it's quite a ways away, so October 12th, well, maybe not, it's three weeks. Oh, sorry, October, yeah, okay, never mind. Uh, so February, February 12th. Uh, uh, sorry, everyone's shouting at me. What? Oh, what, where are you getting that from? Oh, I clicked the wrong Moodle? Yes. Uh, I see, I see. Thank you. My bad, my bad. Sorry, okay, so that was last year's Moodle. Like I said, the assignment was the same as this year. Okay, February 1. Uh, okay, does that make sense? That's less than two weeks, right? Uh, okay, I'll give you two weeks. So. Let's uh, do seventh, I guess. Eight. Okay, sorry, I apologize for that. I will change it. Uh, so you can have a full two weeks. Uh, and so we'll make it due February 8th. Now it is due on Wednesday and we have class on Friday. So this is the way it works. Uh, it's due on Wednesday at eight. If you want to use a slip day, you can. The slip day entitles you to hand it in on Friday at noon. Okay, but you can only use the slip day once. So you have two assignments, you can use it on assignment one. And if you don't use it on assignment one, then you can use it on assignment two. You don't have to tell me you're using the slip day, you can just do it, EAS will accept it, and when we get your assignment two, we'll just check that you're not using two slip days for both of them. Uh, but other than that, you can just use it, okay? So it's there, it gives you an extra day and a half, um, but you can only use it once, either for assignment one or assignment two. Question? Yeah, uh, fe I'll change the, the due date to February, Wednesday, February 8th, and then the slip day will be two days after that. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I heard something about Stride, but can everyone just quiet down? What, what was the question? Okay, so Stride, you'll have three of the sentences will be about the Quebec system and then like one sentence will be about the other two. So you are going to do strive for all three of them, but you're going to spend more time talking about the Quebec and then just a couple sentences about whether it changes for the other two. Yeah. Other questions? Assignment can be any format. So typed, not handwritten, uh, PDF, upload it. It's nice if you, if you label it with your student number dot PDF. Um, but other than that, I don't care, like Word, LaTeX, any lay layout is fine. An individual, yeah. All right, uh, I'll see you guys later. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you.